Hi, I'm John Blunt. I serve as the Associate Pastor at First Baptist Church of Jacksonville at the Nocatee Campus. Thank you so much for watching our sermon today. Our mission at First Baptist is to reach all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life. If you'd like to join us for church in person, we're located just south of Jacksonville in the Nocatee community. We hope you participate with us however you're watching today's service as we worship Jesus, pray, and read His Word together. If you have questions about today's message or just want to connect with us, you can find out more about our church at fbcjacks.com slash Nocatee or on Facebook at First Baptist Church Jacksonville Nocatee Campus. Thanks for joining us. Let's open up to Daniel, book of Daniel, chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. I've been feeling really insecure about attendance on Wednesday nights, so they took chairs out to make me feel better. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it's always funny when we do this. We reset the room because we have a sports camp using our facility right now, so it always makes it feel like it's packed in here. Um, all right, well, we're in a series called Faith Under Fire, and so what we're doing is we're looking at uh, different portraits of characters in the Bible whose faith started experiencing tons of opposition and pressure from the outside. And actually, today's character, characters, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, actually, the, the title is most literally true for them. Their faith literally uh, comes under fire. And so what I want to do is read, we're only going to focus on verses 16 through 18 tonight, but I want us to read the whole chap, uh, the, the first uh, 18 verses, not the whole chapter, the first 18 verses, just so we understand what's going on here. So let me read Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits and its width six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps and the prefects and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, to you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, sultry, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. For this reason, at the time, at, at that certain time, Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, sultry, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, sultry, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, 
we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Let's pray. Father, would you help us right now to learn from these brothers whose faith literally came under fire? Father, I pray we'd learn from the answer that they give to this king how to respond um, when our faith does come under fire. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So my son has recently crossed a threshold uh, for children. Uh, we have, this is our third child, and so we've crossed this threshold with the other two. Uh, in the last, like, six weeks, he's learned how to say no. And he's gotten really, really good at it. Um, so, I mean, I mean, he says no when he wants to say yes. It's like, hey, do you want a popsicle? He's like, no. <laughs> so it's just like the word he says. So we've got training to do in our home right now with uh, my little buddy. And I've been telling him and training him and saying, buddy, you can't say no to daddy. Like, you just can't do that. That's not, you're like, you're at the age, son, where like, when I'm telling you to do something, you really need to do it. I'm teaching him to say yes when daddy gives him instructions, really basic things. You need to say yes when I say it's time for a new diaper. You need to say yes when I tell you to go find your shoes. You need to say yes. You can't say no. And he's kind of catching on. He's having trouble learning how to say yes, so he does this really cute thing where he just kind of like hisses at me and smiles. He's not allowed to be defiant in our home. He's just not allowed to do that. We don't allow that. We don't allow defiance because defiance is bad in a boy my son's age. When a, when a boy is 18 months old, you're just not allowed to do that. Defiance is really bad. But defiance isn't always bad. Defiance is not always a bad thing. And we actually find an example of good, faithful defiance in our passage this evening. So we're in this series called Faith Under Fire. We're looking at these characters from biblical stories, and we're observing how they responded when their faith was put under pressure. What did they do and what lessons can we learn? Because one of the things we said at the beginning of our series is that we're, we're in a culture today where it may not be fiery furnaces, but your, your faith is going to come under fire. And the question is going to be, not if that happens, but what you will do when it happens. And one of the things you're gonna be called to do is to exercise faithful defiance. That's what I'm calling it. Faithful defiance. And we get an example of faithful defiance in this passage. And I want to look at this example tonight because I know that some of the people in this room will be put in a position where you are going to have to exercise faithful defiance. It might happen in your job. It might happen in your relationships it might happen in your family. And so what I want to do is I want to make three observations about faithful defiance in the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that I think will help us, it will help orient us to when we should exercise that sort of defiance. Because I also know that some people hear the word defiance and they're like, sweet, defiance. I can, I can show the man who's boss. And that's not what we're talking about here. So I want to look at this example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and make some observations about what they did. Here's the first observation. The root of defiance is worship. It's the first observation about faithful defiance. The root of defiance is worship. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not looking to pick a fight. Okay, they didn't come into Babylon and saying, here's what we're going to do. We're going to show that king who's boss. 
We're, we're going to challenge him at every step of the way. They actually weren't looking to pick a fight. I actually know that because of the book of Daniel. If you read the book of Daniel, especially the first three chapters, you would see that these men aren't trying to pick a fight. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 4, we're told that they are brought into the kingdom of Babylon and they are taught all the literature and all the culture of Babylon and they raise no issues. They're taught, assuming the religion of the Babylonians, they're taught all the cultural heroes of the Babylonians. They're taught all the literature of the Babylonians and they raise no issues. Then we're told in chapter one, verse five, that they served in the king's court. They're in his personal service to a pagan king and they worship the true God. They raise no issues about serving in the king's court. Chapter one, verse seven. This is really striking. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego take on pagan names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is their Hebrew names. They take on pagan names in chapter 1, verse 7, that are, is paying homage to pagan gods in Babylon. And they don't even raise issue about that. They take on these false god names. These men appropriately are living in their culture as exiles, still being faithful to the one true God. What I'm trying to say here is that they didn't unnecessarily defy authority. They weren't just looking to challenge the king every step of the way. They serve in this culture faithfully when it doesn't violate their worship. But the threshold for defiance for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is worship. I want you to notice this in the text, okay? So just skimming through chapter three, verses one through seven, we find out, so we got Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, sets up this huge like 90 foot statue of himself made out of gold on a plain so it would be visible from all the city. It's this huge golden 10 story statue hovering over the plain. And then if you didn't recognize what instruments are being played, because I read them like five times in the story, there's bagpipes and there's lyres. This is this cacophony of sound comes out. And when that sound is played, everybody in the kingdom, you have to bow down to the golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar. And then not only is there this command given, there is a threat given to anyone that defies the command. Look at verse six. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. We aren't told this in the text, but you can just imagine this room, for example, just full of people. And let's say that basketball hoop over there is our mini Nebuchadnezzar. And the, the, the music plays from the stage and everybody, 500 people in the room, bow down on their faces before our basketball hoop Nebuchadnezzar and three men are standing. You stick out. You stick out. And the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, they're called here, they notice. And so they go and they butter up the king and make an accusation. I always think it's so interesting when you read about how these guys come forward. Oh, king, live forever. That's how they start. And then in verse 12, they say, there are certain Jews, I'm not trying to say any names, whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon. Okay, I'm gonna say names. Namely, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O oh, king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods of worship or the golden image which you have set up. And the king I mean, he's a proud man. He set up a 90-foot statue of himself for people to worship. So obviously, he gets very, very angry. And he calls these men before him to find out if it's true. And he offers them, I'm going to give you one more chance. You can bow down to this statue. And if you don't, though, I'm turning the heat up. Now, I want you to notice the first part of their answer. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king. This is crazy. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. Okay, that's gutsy. So the most powerful king who just set up a 90-foot statue is making everybody bow down to it and has a blazing furnace of fire that he's going to throw in to the fire has just asked you a question about whether or not you're going to worship the statue. And they just say, you know our answer? You know our answer? 
You don't need us to answer you this question. You know what our answer is. They don't even dignify the question with a response. It's defiance. That's what that is. They don't beg for mercy. They don't say, oh, no, no, you didn't understand. They don't compromise. They don't even acknowledge that the king has any authority over this area of their life. They say, we're not even going to give you an answer. We don't answer to you about worship. We don't answer to you for this. This is faithful defiance. This is defiance. So let's just pause here. I'm going to clarify some things. There is a sinful impulse in people to buck against authority. We don't like authority in America. We're part of a democracy. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tread on me. Get off my property. I got this fence up. I've got a security system. Don't get in my space. This is me. Don't tell me what to do. There's a sinful impulse in us that anytime someone gets close, or gives us any sort of dictate, we just want to buck against it at all costs. That is sinful, actually, to disrespect and dishonor authority. That's why the Bible calls us to submit to leaders, to submit to governing authorities. Romans 13, 1 Peter 2. We are called, as Christians, to be people who want to submit to authority. If you're a Christian, you should want to submit to God-ordained authority. Christians are submissive people. But here we see three men not submitting to authority. They're defying authority. Why? Why are they bucking against authority? They're doing it because a ruler has sought to legislate worship away from the true and living God. That's why they did it. He's legislating worship away from the true and living God. And these men defy those commands. They don't even entertain the idea. I will not do it. I won't even consider. I won't even answer the question. I defy this. The reason why they don't entertain the idea is not because they're arrogant men who want to buck against authority. It's actually because they're humble men who are submitting to God's authority in their life. They're humble men who have rooted themselves in worshiping God. And that worship is their primary identity. And so when someone says, hey, uproot yourself and worship over here, they say, I cannot do that. I will defy that command. I want to submit. Sure, I'll work in the court and do my job. I'll take on that name that you want to call me. Whatever. I'm, I'm not trying to cause a fuss. I'm just telling you I'm not going to worship anybody but my God. So defiance isn't rooted in, let me show you what's up. Defiance isn't rooted in pride. Defiance isn't about showing people who's boss. Defiance is rooted in worship. The moments in the Christian life when we're called to defy an authority, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is when we would have to compromise our worship. And that's what you see in the example of these men. Faithful defiance begins by being rooted in worship. And when we do that, when we defy because we're rooted in worship, we trust God with the results of what will happen next. And that's exactly what you see in our second observation here. Second observation is that the hope of defiance is deliverance. The hope of defiance is deliverance. So, let's be clear. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't have a death wish. They're like, you know what? Today would be a great day to take a dip in the fiery furnace. Let's, what can we do to get in there? That's not what's going on. When they defy the command of the king, they aren't first spitting on the king. That's what I want to do. I don't care what you say. That's not first what they're doing. Actually, what they are doing is they are entrusting themselves to God. They're entrusting themselves to his care. They believe something about God. So there's a huge fiery furnace over here. There's a big old statue over there. There's a raging king in front of me. What am I going to do? 
I'm going to entrust myself that, to God, trusting that he can deliver me from this impossible situation. Look at verse 17. Verse 17, they say, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. So let's be clear. These men are putting themselves in a position that God himself will have to deliver them if they want to escape death. There's like nobody on their side. They're in a court with the raging king who just made the 90-foot statue that he wants you to bow down to and a furnace over here and then the guys that ratted you out. Those are the people that are around. What's going to happen? Okay, we're not going to do it. The position they're putting themselves in is God himself is going to have to deliver us. They are hoping in something. They are hoping in God's ability to deliver them. You notice the the words they use. If so, we believe our God is able to deliver us. He can do this. Our God is the type of God who splits seas in half, makes manna rain down from heaven. Our God delivers people from fire. One of the refrains of the Bible, especially you'll see this in the book of Psalms, is this refrain and this prayer that God would not put them to shame. You see that in the book of Psalms. Oh God, do not put me to shame. Listen to this from Psalm 25, verses one and two. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Oh my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exult over me. You see what he's saying? He's saying, I have put myself in a very compromising position. That's what he's saying. I'm, I'm like out there. And I'm doing that because I'm trusting you. And if you don't come through for me, I'm going to be consumed. So don't put me to shame. I'm trusting you. I'm trusting that this is going to work out because you're going to help me. I'm trusting in you. Don't make me look like a fool for trusting you. Don't let me be put to shame. These men believe that God can and will deliver them from the danger of defying the wicked king, and their hope is in God's deliverance. That's their hope. We're hoping that you will deliver us. I ask you a question. Have you ever thought that one of the reasons we don't see God do amazing things in our lives is because we never defy anything. Have you ever thought about that? I'm not talking about being stupid, like going up and like kicking a police officer in the shin and something and saying, deliver me, Lord. That's not what I'm talking about. But think with me. You say, you know, I've never seen any God save anybody before. People tell these crazy testimony stories and I've never seen God change somebody's heart. I've never seen anybody get saved. Well, maybe that might be because we've never defied social norms to ask people about the state of their soul. You ever thought about that? Maybe the reason you're not seeing people get saved is because you're not defying the expectations of our culture that two things you don't talk to people about, politics and religion. I don't wanna wanna shake things up. Well, maybe that's why we're not seeing God's power at work in the lives of our neighbors. We never see God supernaturally protect us because we don't risk our safety or our comfort for Jesus when we're called to do so for kingdom purposes. All the great stories of God's protection come from these missionaries or even pastors and Christians who put themselves out there and take a risk for Jesus Christ and they watch God show up and protect them. We never see God give us favor with our employers as we witness because we don't live as salt and light in the workplace and say, you know what, I'm not gonna do that. I know you want me to do that. I know that's even a part of what you're calling us to do, but I can't do that because I'm trusting in God. And we don't see God give us miraculous favor with our employers because we don't defy anything out of faith and trust that God can deliver us. 
when it looks impossible. The principle that you see in Scripture over and over and over again is that God regularly delivers those in trouble who trust in him and hope in his deliverance in the fiery moments of our faith. God shows up when his people get in these insane predicaments, impossible predicaments, death is coming at me predicaments, and God shows up and he just does crazy stuff to deliver his people. That is what these three men display for us. When we defy, when we have faithful defiance, it's rooted in worship. We should be hoping as the consequences come at us, that God can deliver us. He can make a way where there is no way. He can do things that you are not considering. He can do stuff you've never imagined before. There's story after story after story in the scriptures of God's people entrusting themselves to him, entrusting themselves to his care, hoping in his deliverance, and then God does something that nobody was expecting. Do you want to see God work in your life? We must exercise faith. They are trusting that God can deliver them. But here's the question. What if he doesn't? (laughs) What if he doesn't, though? What if God doesn't deliver them? I think that's the question that most of us ask, right? When we're thinking about like walking across the street and trying to start an awkward conversation about Jesus or we're like in the workplace and we're trying to figure out how we should respond. Well, what if God doesn't deliver me? What if I lose my job? What if someone cusses me out? What, it, what happens then? That leads to the third observation. The third observation about faithful defiance is that the anchor of defiance is Sovereignty. The anchor of defiance is sovereignty. So let's picture the scene. Let's try to get into the courtroom with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they're standing, wherever they are, they're standing before a king who we're told in verse 13 that he has a disposition of rage and anger. Rage. So Nebuchadnezzar is enraged at these three men. They have defied his command. They won't answer his question. Then he gives them another opportunity to bow, and they still don't answer the question. They double down in defiance, and he is angry. They believe God can deliver them, but what if he doesn't? Let's listen to what they say. Verse 18. But even if he does not, isn't that an amazing statement? That's amazing. Even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. That's amazing that they say that in front of him. (laughs) We believe that God can deliver us, but you need to know something. Even if he doesn't, you don't get my worship. Even if God doesn't show up like I want him to, you don't get my worship. I won't do what you say. So I'm not even worried about if the fire consumes me. I will worship my God. Do you see what's anchoring them in this moment? It's not deliverance according to how they desire it. They're hoping in God's deliverance. You see that? They're hoping that God will deliver them from the fiery furnace. But you notice that their hope is not rooted in deliverance happening as they envision it, although they want it to happen a certain way. Their hope is in God. They have a category for God's plan not being their plan. Isn't that amazing? And this does not change the fact that they're not going to worship the gods of Babylon. You see it? God is their God. Deliverance is not their God. It's easy to conflate the two, especially when we want God to do something that we think he'd be glorified by. God is their God not their vision of what it should look like for God to deliver them. That's not their God. 
He is. He is their God. They are trusting God's sovereignty and his plan. If God's plan is to deliver him, he will do it and he's able to do it and we believe he can. If God's plan is for them to be consumed in the fiery furnace, I'm still going to worship my God and not yours. The thing that is meant to anchor us as we practice faithful defiance in various areas of our lives that we're called to is not that it will turn out the way we plan for it to turn out. That's not our hope. It's God's sovereign plan that's our hope. It's trusting God's character, trusting him, and then acting according to his words, and trusting him with the results, whatever those results are. It is our responsibility to worship God alone and to act according to his word by faith. It's not our responsibility to manipulate the results. Do you see that? You might stand up for Jesus and get rejected. It might happen. Someone might get saved. Someone could reject you and tell you to never talk to them again. You might stand up for Jesus and lose your job. You might have a family member yell at you or get your reputation run through the mud. Something bad could happen. It really could. Something you don't enjoy could happen. Defiance may lead to deliverance and it may lead to death is what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are saying. But that does not lead them to waver at all in their faith. Instead, they reaffirm to their commitment to not worship these false gods. There's this amazing section in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, in the hall of faith that we call it, verses 32 through 38. And there's this example of how God works in people's lives who trust him and even defy things and how the results of that are different. Let me just read, I just want to read this section to you. Uh, Listen to this. This is Hebrews 11, verses 32 through 38. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith, now notice one set of results, by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, Daniel, quenched the power of fire. I think that's our three friends here. Escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back the dead by resurrection. That's amazing. God's deliverance. Now notice the other set of people. And others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings. Yes, Also, chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. I love this phrase. Men of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. So you got some people over here who shut the mouths of lions and who are delivered from fire. And then you got other people over here and they're sawn in two. And they're all acting in faith. Some were delivered, some were tortured, all were faithful. And their defiance of this world and its power was rooted and anchored in God's sovereignty. God's got the plan. I don't have it. What's my responsibility is to act in faith. My responsibility is to trust him. The consequences of my faithfulness are up to him in this life. They would worship either way. Brothers and sisters, I just want to encourage you. Real practical encouragement here. This is why it's so important to know Bible stories. You know that? So it's really important to know your Old Testament Bible stories and your New Testament Bible stories. The, pur- the purpose of Bible stories and knowing Bible stories is not first so you can like look at the character sketch and just be like, what are the like things I need to imitate in the Bible character? Because listen, if some of y'all start imitating like Samson, we're going to be in like big trouble, okay? You're not called to imitate every Bible character. You're actually supposed to do the opposite of a lot of Bible characters. 
The point of Bible stories instead, and seeing all these characters, is to know the wide array of how God sovereignly works out his plans through various situations and various people. To see how God works his plan through people who get afflicted and people who part Red Seas. Through people who get sawn in two and people who experience resurrections. That God is working in the, the deliverance and God is working through death. It's about God's faithfulness through the various situations that we encounter in this world. You see, it's, the Bible is all about God. That's what the Bible's all about. It's Him. It's about Him and His glory and His plan and seeing how He works it out in the wonderful times of the lives of saints and in the hardest times of His life. We need a God and we have a God who is working not only when things go well, but He's working when things are devastating. Do you know that? He's working in both. Know the stories. Remember the stories. Let those stories anchor you that you can remember like, oh my goodness, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into a stinking furnace. God can work in my life. I feel like I'm in a furnace. He can work in my life too. The thing that will help your faith endure when your faith goes under fire is a robust view of God's sovereignty his control, that he is huge, he's big, he can work all things together for good in your life, even a fiery furnace. He can work together for good. What is our responsibility is to walk in faithfulness to him and entrust ourselves and the results to him. So most of us know the rest of the story of these guys. Uh, The king, he's filled with wrath, he's filled with rage, And we're told uh, in the rest of the chapter, we won't read it, that they tie the men up in their own clothes and uh, they throw the men into the fire. Into the blazing heat they go. So hot that it kills the guys who are carrying them to the fire. The fire is so hot that it kills the dudes that don't even get thrown into the fire. So hot. Their faith is literally in fire (laughs) in this moment. So it's striking to me Here's this faith. We're hoping that God will deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we will worship, and we will not worship your God. It's striking to me that they aren't delivered before they get thrown into the fire. Isn't it interesting? Why did God do it like that? God was going to deliver them the whole time. Why didn't God just, like, blow out the fire? Why didn't God orchestrate a rainstorm to come and extinguish the flames. God, his plan was that they would get thrown into the furnace in defiance of the king. But then we know the rest of the story, right? Daniel 3, 25. He said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. So it looked like God, I mean, if you were standing there and the furnace was right here on the stage and we were standing here and those guys get thrown into the fire, we would think, well, I guess God didn't. I guess God didn't deliver them like they were hoping. And I can imagine that even some people walked away and said, well, that's it for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They've been incinerated. They get thrown into the fire. It looked like God wasn't going to deliver them, and he lets them get thrown into the fire. Why? I think it's because he wanted to deliver them through the fire. He wanted that scene to happen. He wanted to show up in the heat, right? He wanted to show up inside the furnace, inside thousands of degrees of heat. God wanted to show up there and preserve these men so they didn't even smell like smoke when they came out. 
He wanted to preserve them and get absolute glory. Isn't it amazing? God could have stopped them from getting thrown into the furnace. But he even let them go through all the emotions of being picked up, all the emotions of being bound and seeing the flames, all the emotions of being carried maybe up some stairs, all the emotions of looking down into the flame, all the emotions of being feeling like you've been let loose and feeling your body drop into a furnace, all of that. And then he shows up inside the furnace. Why did God do it like that? Brothers and sisters, I'm just here to tell you, like, that's just how God works. This is what God does. This is how God gets glory. And it's what God did, does in all these Bible stories. Why did he let him get right up to the edge of the Red Sea? Why? As we'll see in a couple of weeks. Didn't God show up earlier with the prophets of Baal and let us have this big showdown with Elijah and altars and water? And why all these details? Why? Why does God do things this way? It's because this is the way he works. He works through death and resurrection. This is how God's work. This is the most important story. It's the story of the cross. Jesus is beaten. Jesus is scourged. Jesus is mocked. Jesus carries the cross. Jesus is nailed into the cross. Jesus is mocked by people who are passing by. Jesus has a spear stabbed through his side. Jesus is mocked by criminals on either side. Why? He dies. Why does he die? So there can be a resurrection. So God can show up. Jesus dies on behalf of sinners for sins he did not commit. He's buried in the tomb for three days. Everybody thought it was over. The disciples are in hiding. And then he is raised by the power of God. It's through death comes resurrection. And that's what he's often going to do with you. I just want you to know that. If you're a Christian, this is what God's going to do with you. He's going to work death and resurrection in your life over and over and over again. You'll feel like sometimes you're dying and God's going to show up there and he's going to bring new life into your life. What is ours to do in all the deaths and all the resurrections of our life as we're following our King, Jesus, is to root ourselves in worship. And then when we do get into the fire, to pray, God, would you just deliver me from this? I don't want to be in this pain. This is too hard. And God often does. But even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, I'll worship him. Even if he doesn't, even if that's not his plan, I'm trusting that he is working for my good. Even if I get thrown into a furnace, I know that this will end in my ultimate deliverance, either now in this life as he does an impossible thing that I can't even see, or in eternity and in the resurrection that I will experience when he returns. I will experience his deliverance, and I will experience now in the trials that I face, in the fire that my faith comes under, his presence. So brothers and sisters, root yourself in worship. Hope in his deliverance. Trust our God. Anchor yourself in his sovereignty. And by God's grace, you will endure when your faith comes under fire. We hope you enjoyed today's sermon. If you have questions about the message, reach out to us at askapastor at fbcjacks.com. We meet for services every Sunday morning and Wednesday evening. For more info, go to fbcjacks.com slash Thank you for watching, and we're praying for you as you go reaching all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life.